but said in a way that that uh, causes me to think. And so let us hear God's word from second chapter, the letter to the Ephesians. At one time, you were like a dead person because of the things you did wrong and your offenses against God. You used to live like people of this world. You followed the rule of a destructive spiritual power. This is the spirit of disobedience to God's will that is now at work in persons whose lives are characterized by disobedience. At one time, you were like those persons. All of you used to do whatever felt good and whatever you thought you wanted so that you were children headed for punishment just like everyone else. However, God is rich in mercy. He brought us to life with Christ while we were dead as a result of those things that we did wrong. He did this because of the great love he has for us. You are saved by God's grace. And God raised us up and seated us in the heavens with Christ Jesus. God did this to show future generations the greatness of his grace by the goodness that God has shown to us in Jesus Christ. You are, by, you are saved by God's grace because of your faith. This salvation is God's gift. It is not something you possessed. It's not something you did that you can be proud of. Instead, we are God's accomplishment, created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'd like to begin our time this morning with an invitation of sorts, an invitation to take a few moments to reflect on your own journey of faith. If we had more time, we could do this in a more extended time, but if you'll indulge me for a few moments, I invite you to think back to a time in your life where God became real to you where you felt God's presence, maybe you came to a deeper understanding about God, or perhaps you found yourself believing more deeply in God's love, in God's peace or joy. If you have a moment or just that feeling in mind, where were you? Who were you with? What were the circumstances of your life at that time? Was it something that happened recently? Or was it a long time ago? Why do you think this moment stands out to you? Why do you think that in the recesses of your mind, this particular memory is so embedded because you've already recalled it a number of times in your life? Once you have that moment in mind, and maybe you've located it on the timeline of your life, I invite you to take a step back. Take a step back and consider its impact on your life. Did it help you in some way? Did it change or alter your view of God and or Jesus? Did it influence the person you are today? If you're anything like me, you're not the same person you were 20 years ago, or 40, or however many years you want to count. You do not believe exactly the same way you did. You don't behave the same way or look the same way. We all change. We all grow. We all succeed. We all fail. We celebrate joys. And we all grieve losses all of these things having an influence on the person we are today. I believe that God created us with a boundless capacity to change and grow, to become more and more aware of the beauty, the complexity, and the uniqueness we all possess as beings created
created and beloved by God. I'm going to say that again. I believe God created us with a boundless capacity to change and grow, to become more and more aware of the beauty, the complexity, and the uniqueness we each possess as beings created and beloved by God. One of the means by which this growth and change occurs, there are many, and if we had time to uh, invite any of you to share what memory or time in your life where Jesus or God became real to you, we discover that it happens in so many ways, in different places, but also we would discover a lot of similarities because it's the same love, the same God who is reaching us. But one of the means or the means by which we grow and change is through our interaction with Holy Scripture, with the Bible. The words themselves don't change, uh, except our English language changes, so we have to keep continually adapting our translations to ensure that we're communicating the truth correctly in the present day. The words don't change, but the way God speaks to us through the word does. Our ability to understand their, the word's depth and the wisdom that comes from scripture increases as we grow in our faith. Well, today's text uh, from Ephesians is one that I've known for many years. Uh, it's one that I've memorized. In fact, I have yet to stumble in at least two places while reading these 10 verses because uh, I've memorized it in a particular translation and I want to go on to the next thought in those particular words. It's one that I've known for years also, and maybe you have as well, because it is really a pivotal and important text in the grand narrative of scripture. It touches on the foundational theme that we find from Genesis to Revelation, and that is the theme of God's grace. God's grace that cannot be earned, God's grace that can only be received as a gift. I believe grace is perhaps pri the primary means by which we experience the love of God. No matter what we do, no matter what we fail to do, none of it can ever separate us from God. We are loved, we are forgiven, we are free from spiritual powers that would lead us away from the life that God has for us in following Jesus. I remember when I first came to understand God's grace in my life. One of the things I associate with it is a very uh, warm light filling my mind and my body. Uh, interesting that my lighting in this room uh, has a, a glow to it. Uh, there's something to God's grace when I first conceived of it or understood it that filled me in a way that I almost can't describe. God loved me, and there was nothing I had to do to earn it. It was free, and yet it was better than anything money or any uh, thing could buy. Grace is what compelled me to follow Jesus. But at the same time, the frame into which I was introduced to God's grace was one that focused primarily and almost exclusively on what was wrong with me that God could fix. At one time, I held the view, and I even preached this for quite a few years, that our ability to understand God's grace is directly connected to the depth of our awareness of our sin. Uh, and there's truth to that. There's truth that we have to understand and think about sin in our lives. But it was always focused on personal sin and not the collective or corporate understanding of sin. And so it's no wonder that many people, uh, good Christian people, uh, fail to see uh, systemic sin, systemic realities like racism or uh, income inequality or things that 
uh, are not part of the just system that God created for us to live in, that we fail to participate in as a collective uh, people. And they fail to see the systemic realities because folks focus only on the personal matters of the heart, the personal ways we offend God and our need for forgiveness for those things. Uh, and really the same could be said about any place where there is an unjust system or uh, oppression. You know, Jesus always sided on what <laughs> landed on the side of the oppressed, always and everywhere. And it's related to what I like to call unchecked uh, uh, desire for power and control. This unchecked desire for power and control is perhaps the most pervasive and destructive form of sin in the world. Anytime power, whether it's political or economic, gets uh, a hold of what I, the message of grace, gets a hold of this God-given gift of grace, it can become a tool used to control behavior and perpetuate the corporate sin that I like to call otherizing. Otherizing, it's interesting on, in word, it doesn't underline that word as a misspelling, <laughs> otherizing. In order for me to, so for example, to be righteous and holy, there must be a corresponding other to label as unrighteous or unholy. In order to maintain my high standard of living, there must also be a corresponding uh, standard of poverty or poverty exists. Unfortunately, the church uh, is a prime historic example, church, big C church, <laughs> the church universal, uh, is a prime historic example of power corrupting the good news of grace. Uh, grace will always be like a, connected to forgiveness of our sins. I'm not questioning that. But grace is also, and perhaps more pervasively and important to address, is how grace is about discovering our belovedness, is more about discovering how beloved we are by God than coming to terms with our own personal sinfulness. Because grace, in the end, is not fire insurance to save us from eternal punishment. Grace is claiming that we are beloved of God and declaring the same for every other person who is a child of God. I've always known and believed in this more, what I call, expansive view of grace but I never allowed it to be front and center because I was too busy otherizing, which requires differentiating the sinners from the saints. Otherizing is a tool used by the powerful to keep us busy and to avoid seeing the real injustice of injustices of the world, the things that truly break God's heart. Well, if there's one thing that I hope you will associate with uh, these beautiful words about grace from the letter of Ephesians is that it truly does have more to do than, than with our personal, the ways we may personally participate in offending God or not following God's way in our lives, but that we are part of uh, we need to recognize uh, how corrupt with power certain systems become that end up perpetuating violence and hurt towards other people. But if there's one sort of phrase that I continue to claim and I continue to preach about grace that comes from this letter uh, is a statement that goes like this. There is nothing you and I can do to make God love us more than God already does. You ever heard that before? It's not something I've come up with, but I can't find the source. I've never been able to find the source. There is nothing you and I can do that will make God love us more than God already does. Nothing can take away our belovedness as a child of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God as we 
read the beautiful words in Romans chapter eight. And like I said, I chose to read from the Common English Bible translation because I think it captures the message of grace in this broader and expansive way. Uh, instead of saying uh, we are God's workmanship, which some uh, translate it that way, uh, the handiwork of God, uh, it says instead we are God's accomplishment, verse 10. We are God's accomplishment created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. Another translation for accomplishment uh, is we are God's masterpiece. We are that work of art that God created. And as one, trans, as, as one translation puts it, but our task, I believe, is not to overly dwell on our sin, but to dwell on the grace that frees us and forms us into the people God created us to be, to do the work of spreading that grace, that free, unmerited, undeserved love, forgiveness, peace, that God longs to fill us with, just like those times that we recall where we feel especially close to God. Those thin places, as I've described, child walled uh, sanctuary in, in many ways, where the distance between heaven and earth is so thin that you feel God in you and in each other and in a physical space. That's the grace we're supposed to take with us, to carry with us, to receive into our own lives, and then reflect that grace to the world around us, to the people we know, to the people we love, the people we don't know, <laughs> the people who are harder to love than others. Uh, and I think for me, um, one of the things that the, the real tragedies of our pandemic right now and the results of this is that it has uh, entrenched many people, in some ways myself included, uh, in some of my beliefs about things and about the world and about where we are and where we're headed and, and what we need to do about it. Let's just put it that way. Uh, it's impacted my view on so many ways uh, that in some ways in my mind, I think I may have created more, more enemies than I, than I would like to care to admit, or not enemies, but people who give me the opportunity to otherize people, to claim a view for ourselves that then forces us to hold something opposite or other uh, for the other person. And, and God doesn't do that. God never does that. God is always pouring forth grace, freedom, form to, and forming us into people who reflect that grace. Because just as I'm in need of that grace, the people who are harder to love in our lives, the people that we have difficulty with, whether we know them or they're uh, popular figures, we all need that grace. I, um, one of the things I like to do, I've been thinking about more as the vaccine has unrolled is, um, you remember that pre-pandemic activity called eating in a restaurant? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward. I don't think it's gonna happen for a little while for me, but I. I think back to uh, times when I've really enjoyed uh, a great meal. And one of the places that we do that is this little uh, wine bar and vegetarian restaurant in Clifton Park called uh, Antipastos. And a couple of years ago, uh, we took a couple of close friends with us. And uh, one of our friend was asking about one of the dishes uh, because it had talked about being uh, having a lot of mushrooms in it. And so he was asking some questions about it. And uh, the waiter says back, well, yes, that would, that would be a very mushroom forward dish. And it's become a, a, a joke for us to, uh, anytime I cook something, you know, that, that dish is very uh, squash forward. It's, it's very uh, uh, ginger forward and uh, just become a running joke. But I, I, I never thought I would apply it to a sermon, but I'm gonna do it here. I think that, that while it's certainly no easy task, how amazing would it be if we could live 
our lives and live a grace forward life. To let grace shape who we are, how we interact, how we live our lives each and every day. You know, grace is, uh, we, we can't wait to fully understand and comprehend grace in order to reflect it. If we do, we'll never get there. It's too expansive. It's too beyond our mind. It's mind blowing. It's too slippery to hold onto uh, and, and, and try to capture fully. That's why we change and we grow because the vastness of God's grace is not something we can comprehend at any one time and place. But God uses all the circumstances of our lives and, and the ups and the downs, the joys and the struggles to help us come to a deeper awareness of God's love, of God's joy, God's peace. So what would it look like if we were to live a grace forward life? I think it's our job is to simply receive that grace. That's our job is to receive that grace anew. Maybe we've done it a thousand times, but to continually receive it and to live our lives in such a way that we reflect that grace back to the world, back to our communities, back to our families, back to our loved ones. May this Lenten season as this theme of grace is lifted up, be a time where we commit to this grace forward life. Amen. Amen.